Today I'm not just going to teach you what shutter speed, aperture, and ISO do, although that is where we're going to start. More importantly, by the end of this video, I'm going to teach you my exact system, start to finish, to pick the correct shutter speed, aperture, and ISO every time. These are the most important camera settings in photography, so pay attention. Let's start with this box that has a hole in it. It is the basis of all photography. Once we put something like a film at the back of this box, which is sensitive to light, we have a camera. It's the simplest camera you can have. But from this incredibly minimalist camera, we can learn a surprising amount about camera settings. And mastering those three, shutter speed, aperture, and ISO, depends on having a really deep intuition of how they work. And to start, the big question you should ask yourself is, how bright will your photo be? One part of that is just the brightness of the outside world. We call this the ambient light. And sometimes you can change the ambient light by adding a flash, or you can filter the ambient light by putting sunglasses on your camera. Or if you want to be professional about it, you could use something like this filter instead. But a lot of times, you'll just have to deal with the amount of light that's already there. So, what can we change about the camera itself to capture more or less light? Well, first, you can just change how long you're taking the picture. If I cover up the hole, and then I let it open, and then I cover it up again, that was roughly two seconds where the film was exposed to the outside world. If I had exposed it for longer, the photo would be brighter because I literally capture more light. Now, real cameras don't have tiny people that cover the lens. Uh, instead, they have something called a shutter that's in front of the film itself, or of course, in front of the digital camera sensor. And that's why we call the length of your exposure your shutter speed. In this example, my shutter speed was two seconds. But on an actual camera, you have a huge range of shutter speeds. Uh, the one that I'm filming with right now shoots everything from 30 seconds at the long end to a rapid fire 1 8,000th of a second. And it's not just about capturing light. Uh, shutter speed also affects how much motion you capture. If I've got a two second shutter speed like I just showed, and someone walks through the photo, there's no way that they're gonna be sharp. Uh, they'll kinda look like this. And forget moving subjects. Even hand-holding your camera can make a photo blurry. If too many of your pictures look like this, shutter speed is the reason why. Because if you're taking a two-second long photo, like I talked about a moment ago, it's pretty much impossible to hold your hands perfectly steady for two seconds. If you've got a typical lens, you might need 1 30th of a second or 1 50th instead, maybe even faster, just to get a sharp photo. Okay, we've got shutter speed out of the way. But let's take another look at this camera. Uh, there's still one more obvious way to capture a brighter photo, and that is to make this hole larger. Anytime that the area doubles, you're also doubling the amount of light that you capture. And of course, that leads to a brighter photo. And this hole is something that exists in every camera lens. We call it the aperture. I've got a lens right here, and perhaps you can see that I'm changing the size of the aperture. And just like shutter speed, aperture carries along some side effects. It doesn't just control how much light you capture. It also changes something called depth of field. Now what is depth of field? Well, it's all about how much of your photo is sharp from front to back. If you've ever seen photos with dreamy, blurry, out of focus backgrounds, aperture is probably the reason why. And the larger the aperture, the larger the blur in the background. Now, those are the only three ways to capture more light. First, ambient brightness and then shutter speed and aperture. But what if your photo is still too dark? That's gonna be pretty common with some types of photography. And in that case, what you can do is increase the sensitivity of your film, or the closest digital camera equivalent, which is called ISO. Now something similar would be opening your dark picture in Photoshop and then bumping up the brightness. Of course, when you do any of those, your photo's gonna to start to look something like this. Very grainy, although this is exaggerating things a bit, because you're not actually capturing more light. It's kind of like getting background static on a microphone that you've turned up really high. So now you've got all the background knowledge. Uh, it's time to explain my complete system of choosing the perfect shutter speed, aperture, and ISO every time. And the best way to do that is to look at some example photos. Now we'll start with this one. And here are the camera settings that I used for it. This might look like a difficult photo to take, but my settings here were really easy. So first, I always work backwards and start with ISO. 
by default, I set it to ISO 100, which is the lowest on my camera. And I do this because remember, with ISO, you're not actually capturing more light. You'll get cleaner photos if you set a low ISO and brighten your photo with shutter speed and aperture instead. So the next step is aperture. I think of this as the most important camera setting because it affects depth of field. And depth of field has a huge creative impact on the appearance of your photo. And here, I wanted to isolate my subject with a nice blurry background. So I used the largest aperture on my lens. Remember, the largest opening means the most blur in the background. And on this lens, the largest aperture happened to be f4. So the next step was just to pick a shutter speed that gave me the right brightness. Here, that turned out to be 1 250th of a second. And in this case, that was great because it was fast enough to get rid of motion blur. Maybe if the puffin had been flying, the photo would have been blurry at 1 250th of a second, but instead it's just standing there and my photo is completely sharp. So this was an easy one because I got to use exactly the settings I wanted. And now let's look at a similar but slightly more complicated example. I took this dragonfly photo at 1 400th of a second, f4, ISO 280. And we'll work backwards again from ISO. Once again, at first, I set it to the lowest value, ISO 100. Then I move to aperture. I still want a large amount of blur in the background, so I'm going to use a large aperture. In this case, f4 once again. And finally, I move to shutter speed. Here, I would have gotten the proper exposure at 1 150th of a second. So why didn't I use that shutter speed? Motion blur. This dragonfly was on a flower that was moving in the wind, and close-up photography is already magnifying any camera shake in the first place. So in order to get a sharp photo here, I needed to use a faster shutter speed, specifically 1 400th of a second. That had a ripple effect, and this is also where the system comes into play. It's kind of like a zigzag. I've done ISO, aperture, and shutter speed, and now I need to double back. So back to aperture. I'd rather not change my aperture here because I'm happy with my depth of field, so I'm keeping it at f4. And that brings us back to ISO. My photo is too dark with the settings I've got right now, so I have no choice but to bump up the ISO. That's not ideal, and it is true that there's a little bit more grain in this photo if you zoom all the way in, but it's much better than capturing motion blur or the wrong depth of field and ruining the shot. Now let's look at a completely different picture, this time a landscape photo. And again, I started with ISO 100 because it's the base ISO on my camera. But then I needed a huge depth of field to capture this photo. It's not at all like the previous examples where I wanted a blurry background. So in this case, I used a really small aperture, f16. And this is where I do a side note, because if you've been paying attention, you probably just heard me say that f16 is a small aperture, and earlier I was saying that f4 is a large aperture. And those are both true. What a lot of people don't understand about aperture is that it's written as a fraction. If you have one fourth cup of salt, that's a pretty large amount of salt. And if you have one sixteenth cup of salt, that's much smaller. Aperture is the exact same way. f4 is pretty large, f16 is pretty small. So jumping back to the photo. I've got a low ISO and a small aperture of f16 to get maximum depth of field. So now I just need whatever shutter speed gives me the proper exposure. In this ambient light, that happens to be 1 60th of a second. And because nothing in the photo is moving, and I was shooting from a tripod, I'm not really at risk of motion blur. So those are my final settings. And here's another picture, this time a cityscape. I did the same thing as before, ISO 100 to start, and then depth of field. It wasn't really an issue here, because no matter what you do, you can't really get that shallow a depth of field when everything is so far away. So I just set a medium aperture, f7.1. That's a good balance, because medium apertures tend to be a little sharper than the ones at the extreme. It's not normally a big deal, depth of field is way more important, but when everything's in the distance anyway, you might as well set one of those medium aperture values. And then it was down to shutter speed. As you can tell, it's after sunset when I took this photo, and in order to get the right brightness, I needed a pretty long shutter speed. In this case, exactly one second. Now, if I held my camera while taking this picture, 
the photo would have been pretty blurry up close because I can't keep my hands completely steady for a full second. But I was using a tripod, which gives you so much more flexibility in your shutter speed. So the photo at one second is incredibly sharp. Although you might notice that some of the ships in the background are blurry because they moved during the exposure. It doesn't really bother me here because they're not the main subject, but that is the way that things are gonna be when your shutter speed gets too long. Next, let's take a look at a picture that was very complicated to set properly, this wildlife photo. And maybe you can start to see some of the difficulties just by looking at it. Uh, it's not too bright out, my subjects are moving pretty fast, and I want a lot of depth of field. No out of focus backgrounds here because I really like the iceberg in the distance. So let's work through the process again. Uh, start at ISO 100 and then set your aperture to whatever you need in order to get the right depth of field. Here, unfortunately in a way, I need a lot of depth of field. So I'm going to set F16. Now why is this unfortunate? Well, F16 is a very small aperture. Again, like 1 16th of a cup of salt. I do get a lot of depth of field, which is nice, but the opening in the lens just is very small and does not let in very much light. And now we're on to shutter speed. In order to get the proper brightness here, I would need 1 50th of a second exposure, but that's just not gonna work. The birds are flying way too fast. In fact, they're flying so fast that I had to set 1 400th of a second, and even that barely worked. When I zoom in, you can see that the bird on the right actually has a little bit of motion blur in the wing. Not enough to really mess up the photo, but clearly 1 400th of a second was the absolute longest exposure that I could have used here. So I had to cycle back. Uh, I can't really change aperture because I need that depth of field, so I'm leaving it at f16. And then ISO is the only one left. I have no choice here but to bump up the ISO to 800, otherwise my photo is just too dark. Now I could take a photo that's really dark and brighten it in Photoshop, but you tend to get better image quality when you use ISO instead. And those are my final camera settings here. You'll notice if I zoom in that there's definitely some grain and discolored pixels, but that's a side effect I have to live with. The only way to fix it would have been with a longer shutter speed or a wider aperture, and both of those carried consequences that I just wasn't willing to accept. So let's wrap things up with a Milky Way photo, because these are not easy to take and a lot of people want to know how to do it. Here's the photo in question. We're going to go through the same process, start with ISO 100, then move to aperture. Now everything here is somewhat far away from my camera. I'd probably want a medium aperture, maybe leaning toward a small aperture for depth of field. Let's say f8. And now we're on to shutter speed. One thing that's important for Milky Way photography is that the stars are moving across the sky. It's not something that's easy to notice with the naked eye, but with a camera, anything longer than 20 or 30 seconds, and you'll actually get blurry stars in your photo. And it does depend on your lens and also the direction that you're facing, so you should definitely take some test photos. Here, the absolute longest I could get away with was 25 seconds. That's a problem, because at 25 seconds, f8 and ISO 100, the photo would have looked something like this. Not ideal. So let's keep going through the process. I'll skip aperture again and leave it at f8 because I really want that depth of field. Uh, time to bump up my ISO. But it turns out that in this case, I would have needed an ISO of 25,600 just to get a bright enough photo. That is not a good recipe for good image quality. Uh, here's a photo that I took in the past at ISO 25,600. So what's left? There's hardly any ambient light here. I've maxed out my shutter speed. A flash certainly won't light up the stars because they're stars. So the only thing left is to use a wider aperture so that I can capture more light. And that's exactly what I did. I used the widest aperture on my lens, f2.8 in this case. I don't love doing that for landscape photography because you do lose depth of field, but it was my only option here. So that leaves 25 seconds, f2.8, and then I get a well-exposed photo at ISO 3200. And those are my final settings. It's still a pretty high ISO, and we can definitely see some grain when I zoom in. On top of that, take a look at this area of the bridge. It's definitely out of focus thanks to my aperture, and there's no way around that. But you know, if you look at the photo as a whole, it's sharp. Surprisingly sharp, considering that it's the Milky Way I'm photographing. 
I did have to compromise on ISO and depth of field, and that's not ideal, but it also doesn't ruin the photo. So let's go back one last time to the system. I've already demonstrated how it works, but let me explain the actual steps involved. Now you start with ISO. Set the base ISO on your camera. For most cameras, that's ISO 100. Next, go to Aperture. Set whatever aperture gives you the right depth of field. Whether you want a shallow focus effect or a huge depth of field, this is where you'll pick it. Then go to Shutter Speed. Set the value that just gives you a proper exposure. That does depend on the ambient light, but a lot of times you'll be done after this step. The exception is if you're getting motion blur at that shutter speed. If you don't want motion blur, you have to set a faster shutter speed. But now, your photo's gonna be too dark. So the final step is to get back that brightness. You could just change the ambient light if you have control over it, but normally this boils down to using a higher ISO or potentially a larger aperture. Each one has a compromise, as I've shown, uh, I personally tend to start with ISO because I'm very picky about my depth of field and I'd rather keep the same aperture. But as I showed in the Milky Way photo, sometimes that just won't be possible. And there's the system. Five steps. I have yet to come across a subject that this doesn't work for. It's also a lot quicker in practice than when I'm talking about it here. If you're just shooting one type of subject, you can probably use the same aperture and potentially the same ISO for a bunch of photos in a row. You can even let the camera automatically float your shutter speed to the right exposure. And that makes this system almost too quick. Now I've added a couple of related links below the video, but regardless, by now, you've got the groundwork. Shutter speed, aperture, and ISO are more important than any other settings in photography. And this is a system that won't let you down.